for us Italians, but good evening, everyone. And I'm, we are here at the um, Filming Los Angeles, uh, uh, Filming Italy Los Angeles, ninth edition. And you know that this panel was co-organized by the uh, Italian trade agency Los Angeles office. The title is The Renaissance of Italian Audiovisual Industry and its Impact on Italian Talents in the US. So we are going to discuss in a few minutes, but before that, I'm going to give the floor to the Trade Commissioner uh, of Los Angeles, Alessandra Rainaldi. Buonasera, buon pomeriggio, good afternoon, everyone. So it's uh, my pleasure as Trade Commissioner to welcome you again. This is the third edition for Italian Trade Agency supporting the, this festival. And uh, this year, of course, this is a, a collaboration that we started uh, in the, the framework of our promotional activities and supporting uh, in the Italian film and TV industry here in the US. So it's not something that we do, you know, just for glamour. Um, the idea, uh, we are committed as Italian trade agency uh, to bridge the Italian film industry with the US market. Uh, we have so many activities during the year. Um, and uh, of course, uh, uh, this collaboration with the festival, which is one of the well uh, known uh, festival of Italian film and TV uh, here in LA, uh, is a pleasure because every year we have the opportunity also to uh, focalize on uh, different topics uh, and uh, on these different topics, uh, enhance the collaboration between our producers, uh, between our art directors, and the entire, I would say, Italian film industry with the US producers. Um, so last, in the last years, we have focused, I was telling uh, before, uh, to our host, to our panelists uh, representing women in film on the topic of women uh, in entertainment. Uh, so this is not a topic that we want to leave ahead, but it's always on uh, our, you know, heart. Uh, but to uh, to this, this year, we would like to focus on uh, this uh, topic of the Italian Renaissance uh, industry in film and TV. Uh, because we believe that there are so many achievements that Italy is reaching uh, in the last years. And uh, so there are, uh, you know, uh, room for conversation between Italy and uh, US on uh, these topics. Which achievements? Uh, for example, uh, the first one is uh, uh, the Cinecittà uh, uh, achievements in the last year in, uh, that has attracted more and more new co-production uh, from US and from international co-production. Uh, there was, uh, in the last weeks, uh, uh, a statement from the CEO of Cinecittà uh, saying that uh, the revenue of Cinecittà in, in the last years passed to uh, 16 million to 
100 million. This is uh, the, the sign that so Cine Città is attracting more and more uh, US um, talents, film uh, producer, and so on. There are so many, of course, co-production of our Italian filmmakers with the US, just looking at uh, the uh, Sorrentino, Guadagnino, and why not, <laughs> Matteo Garrone. Uh, so this is another achievement, because you know that uh, Matteo Garrone, with his Io Capitano, uh, is our candidate film for uh, the next Oscar. And uh, the topic is uh, so relevant, because talking about uh, the drama of the African diaspora uh, to Europe, and so the dream <laughs> to have a better future for um, this uh, amazing continent. And uh, I would like also to leave you this uh, uh, new perspective that is uh, why we, are, we want to celebrate together the renaissance of the Italian industry. A few weeks ago in Washington, during a meeting, uh, uh, during a screening of Io Capitano, the delegation coming from the Ministry of Culture announced also, you know, the opportunity uh, to MPA Association to create a, a bilateral cooperation in the film industry. Uh, so this is something that Italy has already achieved with Japan, and so this was a proposal made from the Italian side to the uh, MPA Association. So I think that there are so many, you know, uh, topics to discuss uh, together. And uh, I will leave now the floor to you, Tiziana. Uh, really thank you that, uh, for, because I think that this collaboration between us can increase in the future with so new many talents and filmmakers that every year you uh, bring here in LA. And uh, so thanks again for this collaboration. Thank you, thank you, Alessandra. I, I really thank you, Ita, always for the collaboration. I really thank you, you know, all the guests uh, that are here. Welcome, Filming Ita and Alessandra are very happy to start this opening today. And I really, you know, I want to thank you all the panelists, the Ginevra El Khan, director for I Told You So, and Kelly Cali, actress, director, and Riccardo Stamaccio, actor, producer, and Scott Nemes, president of TV HBO. Thank you also to our moderator, Lucia Maggi, journalist, but you know, this year we celebrate also 50 years of Women in Film. You know, we collaborate a lot with the Women in Film uh, LA, Women in Film Italy, we always screen many movies of, uh, you know, women director, and I want to welcome here, you know, the senior director of event, Laur Camille Lauri, that have, uh, uh, you know, we celebrate also 50 years of Women in Film. Thank you to be here, you know, like that, uh, you know, you, now it's your moment. Buonasera. I just want to say a few words. Um, so I'm Camille Lowry, the Senior Events Manager at Women in Film, and I'm pleased to be here to tell you about our organization. Um, this year, this past year, 2023, was called the Year of the Woman. We asked ourselves, how many of these years is it going to take for there to be gender equity? According to the United Nations, at the current rate of progress, it will take 140 years for women to be represented equally in positions of power and leadership in the workplace. Our business at Women in Film is to innovate solutions and amplify voices for those who can change these statistics in, within entertainment. Founded in 1973, Women in Film is celebrating its 50th year um, um, of working for gender parity. Our advocacy, career programs, and research efforts are a driving force for increasing gender representation in Hollywood. We are proud of our legacy, but our goal is really not to exist anymore. We want to work really hard so that uh, you don't need us. Uh, we don't have time for 140 years, and we don't even want to wait another 50. So to dismantle gender bias and achieve an equitable industry that reflects our population, Women in Film is committed to building a talent pipeline, sustaining careers, and advocating for women, non-binary, and trans people. Our programs have gotten bigger and better thanks to investments from Michelin line companies such as Max Mara or uh, the Gates Foundation. We've expanded our 30-year mentoring program to a fellowship with a strategy to advance careers. I'll give you one short example. Um, we have a production program and there was a short uh, made called Your, Mo Your, Your Monster. And one of the mentors 
who was an executive from Merman Productions, uh, really got involved. And that movie was released in January as a feature. We are also investing in programs like Reframe Rise that supports mid-career directors and cinematographers in getting hired in pilots and studio features. And through our gender-balanced uh, ballot initiative, we are pushing for better representation in award season, which we're in the thick of now, and especially in categories like cinematography and visual effects, in which there are rarely women represented. Um, for that very reason, Women in Film hosts the only Oscar party to celebrate all the female nominees across every category. This year, there are 77. Uh, in 2023, we also gather people from across the industry in a series of intimate salons, storytellers with storytellers, executives with executives, and we ask them to imagine a more equitable industry. And we ask them, what does the Hollywood they want to live in look like? and what it would take to achieve that vision. From those salons, we created the Action 50 campaign, which was launched, launched at Sundance and um, partnered with IMDb this past January, just, just now. And it's a list of 50 specific actionable items that the industry can take to, to um, achieve uh, a more inclusive Hollywood. Examples, buying a ticket to a female-made film, um, mentoring the next generation, or sender, setting a gender equity goal for your own company. Listen, we understand that this is a business, but it's also an art form with tremendous power to open hearts and minds. And in these times, we think we need more stories bringing people together, stories that are aligned with women in film's mission, that center on the underrepresented voices celebrate differences, and transform culture. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now, okay, we have like a little bit more than 30 minutes to discuss our panel. I'm gonna do a quick presentation, introduction of you. So since we are in the VGA theater, I'm gonna start with the director. So Kelly Kaeli, uh, you are a writer, an actress, and a director, and a producer. So yeah, you too. Born and raised in LA, yeah. in 2020, you directed, wrote, produced, and directed and starred yeah. in your first movie, I'm Fine, Thanks for Asking, and it was the title. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now you are out with, I, I know that I'm Fine has a little bit of Italian inspiration in it, we are going to discuss it. And now you are out with the Kimba, which is a, like a legal drama you yeah. directed. Inspiring a true story. Your colleague here, Geneva Elkan, coming of course from Rome, Italy. You also are a screenwriter, a producer, and a director. Your fir her first film in 2019 was Magari, if only. And now she's here with uh, her second film, feature film, which is uh, I Told You So, okay? And it was very well received, <laughs> very well received in Italy. It uh, premiered at Toronto Film Festival, right? But we can't catch up with that. We, we live here, so we just couldn't see the movie before. We can catch up this afternoon, this evening at 6.15 here. And then we have Ricardo, of course. Ricardo Scarmaccio is one of the best and best known actors we have in Italy. He is here because he's in Geneva's movie, but also because he came with uh, Race with Glory. Uh, by glory, sorry, for glory, sorry, and <laughs> and you also just wrapped a very interesting project. He was Modigliani, the painter in Modi, uh, directed by Johnny Depp. <coughs> so it's gonna be interesting to hear from you, Scott Nims. Mm, hi, welcome. So Scott, he's the head television at Egbo. Egbo is the independent. Mm, production company that Joe Russo and then Tony Russo founded. And he shot last year, he shot, uh, he shot uh, in Italy, in Sardinia, the first international chapter of Citadel, this big, big TV show. And Matilda De Angelis was starring. Matilda, I met her here last year, and she was so excited about that project. So 
I'm sure it's gonna be interesting to hear from you. So just to, we have like half an hour now, so uh, to set like a common ground for us to discuss, I would, ask, I would like to ask each of you, when, I, when discussing Italian film, what comes into your mind? Is a memory, a title maybe? What, what makes Italian movies or Italian production different from others coming from other countries? Uh, yeah, I will start with you. Uh, well, hello. Hi. Uh, for me, growing up here in Los Angeles, um, I truthfully, as a child, wasn't exposed to a lot of Italian films. My father was a pastor and my mother was an aerospace engineer. So <laughs> wasn't a lot of art going on <laughs> in the household. But um, I remember the first time I saw Life is Beautiful with Roberto Benigni. And I could not, I had never seen a movie like that done so well on such a tough subject matter, such a serious thing that you do not laugh about yet he was able to find the balance of joy and life in the hardship of, of despair. And when I saw that, I, I, I was like, if I'm ever telling stories, I wanna tell stories like him. I wanna tell stories like uh, Italian cinema. So I dove in a little bit more, and one of the greatest things that I found, um, that I eventually learned at USC for my master's, was the art of storytelling through just images. And I find that I was just in, um, in Rome for the Rome Inter Independent Film Festival, and I was there screening um, one of my latest films. And Kimba, <laughs> I'm like, which movie? Kimba. And I went to some of the other films, but they did not have English subtitles, and I unfortunately do not speak Italian. I need to work yes. on that, but <laughs> yet. And so I still went to the, to the theater and I still watched multiple films and every single film I understood what was going on because there's something about Italian cinema that even, and these were young filmmakers that are able to, um, I just feel like it's masters of story, being able to tell things visually um, without words, even though there are, but it, it's just something that I've always looked up to and I've been able to incorporate into some of my films. Thank you. Ginevra, for you, you told me before that we are free in Italy and in Europe. We, no, we can complain, but at the end of the day, we are pretty free. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I think what's very distinctive, you know, I mean, I can talk about Italian cinema in general or Italian cinema now. Uh, and of course, I totally agree with what you're saying. What's very distinctive about Italy is this capacity of, you know, treating drama and comedy at the same time, which is really what life is about. And so there's a very human side to Italian film, which, you know, is certainly part of Italian culture. And, <coughs> you know, it's, it's a very strong <coughs> characters and story. And what I was saying before is that I feel that in a, you know, world today where everything feels so extremely censored and where you, you can say this, but you can't really say that. And, you know, what are you saying? You know, there's like a lot of, a lot of talk about what you're allowed or not to say. And a point of view is not so allowed today. In Italy uh, and in Europe in general, I feel that there we still have a freedom mm -hmm. of a point of view. And we have a freedom to tell stories in the way that, you know, we want to tell them and, you know, because there are stories of people and you're focusing on humanity and, you know, and they might be not perfect and they might be, you know, flawed in every possible way, but we can still love them. Yeah. <laughs> and flaws are okay. And, <coughs> and I think we are allowed this freedom in a way also because, you know, we're very lucky 
the other thing about Italian and European cinema is we are very fortunate that we have incredible crew mm -hmm. and incredible, you know, incredible people we work with for costumes and production design <coughs> and DPs and, you know, and we are very often state funded, mm -hmm. you know. So in Italy, we have the Ministry of Culture, and we have <coughs> RAI, and we have that fund our films, mm -hmm. and they allow for this freedom. And I think that that's really an invaluable gift mm -hmm. that we are given. Yeah, I agree. Ricardo, for you? Well, um, hello, everyone. Um, of course, uh, you know, if I think in Italian cinema, I, I cannot not thinking of Fellini, Eight and a Half, which is the story of a director that he doesn't know which kind of movie he's gonna make. So it's a, it's a movie on it's a, like a meta cinematic film, um, and um, and we had in the past you know very important directors that gave us like. A, Huge heritage. I mean, yeah, which is, yeah, it's a big responsibility. But still, you know, this and uh, this is what I personally I think that you know, this anarchist side of our cinema, um, based on like um, because we have less money to make movies, um, which is of course, you know, a shame. What a shame we have less money. But sometimes this it could be. Uh, it could be an opportunity to to make something special. We know that uh, the, the most incredible piece of cinema we've seen in our life, behind those films, there are incredible stories of friendship, uh, trading, fighting, like uh, real life. Uh, if we think about Taxi Driver, you know, Martin Scorsese, what I'm trying to say is that um, to make a film is is an alchemy. It's like uh, it's an adventure, and uh, and uh, and sometimes you know all the elements they have has to be there to create something something special alive. Um, it's um, yeah. Uh, that's it. It's <laughs> quite enough. <laughs> Um, uh, I also agree with you. Fellini, for me, was my first introduction at watching it happen in, in film school uh, to Italian cinema and really opened my mind to what a true auteur looks like and having the freedom to really express your point of view creatively um, w was really amazing. And, and looking at the evolution of Italian filmmaking from Fellini to Paolo Sorrentino to uh, Stefano Solima um, and on and on. And it, it's been really incredible to watch the uh, tours in the country grow uh, the industry and, and, and how the uh, tourship has maintained in Italy, which I think in other parts of the world we, we end up being more watered down for the most part um, in our content. So it's been pretty, very impressive. Thank you. So, uh, Ginevra, I would start with you because you are in Italy, you have the pulse of Italian industry <laughs> right now. So the data that uh, Alessandra Rainaldi was telling us suggests the idea that there's a new golden age of Italian production. Do you feel this as in your personal experience? I mean, as a producer, as a director, but also as a moviegoer. The golden age might be a bit much, but uh, <laughs> uh, I wish <laughs> I could see this golden age. But uh, I think that, you know, right now we see that a lot of people are going to movie theaters, which is a new data. This has happened since October, November. So people had stopped going to movie theaters and now they are going and they're not just going to see big comedies, they're going to see, you know, Vim Benders and Carries Mackey and you know they're making big numbers, so that's very encouraging to see this this whole new trend 
and uh, you know, and I think that there there been a lot of incentives in Italy <coughs> to bring production to Italy to Cinecittà, and so there are a lot of foreign films and TV series that are being shot in Italy. Uh, you know, which is great for crews and which makes it difficult to get, you know, your, you want to, your, you know, your DP or your anyone and they're working on all these productions. So the definitely Rome is very busy with production and that's a very, <coughs> you know, encouraging. Um, although everyone is obviously looking at what the future is going to be like and it's very uncertain because if you had told me that people would go back into movie theaters this way I, I don't think that I would have thought so and so yeah I think it's it's very uncertain times in general we don't really know where we're going and what's going to happen with AI and what's going to happen <laughs> With platforms and all, so it's it's really in in construction, and I think it's it's pretty much the same everywhere. So every field, every field, yeah. And Ricardo, for you, I mean, has it changed in last years? Are you receiving more international projects, for example? Um, well, um, uh, we can say that, that, that there is this like a globalization localization of um, <laughs> of uh, uh, films and audiovisual I would say more than films uh, through those platforms um, but uh, we, we can't say that all the audiovisual is cinema because we cannot say that you know uh, those TV series most of them you know they shoot the, the, the schedule they didn't shoot the script as a, as a good friend of me said the other night. You're not gonna <laughs> tell no, I'm not gonna say who is this man. But he's a big American, Italian American actor. And ah, so <laughs> there's a, a nice expression that I... Uh, so if we, we talk about cinema, yes, th th there, is, there is like a kind of new energy, there are new directors, kind of new interesting films I've seen. But um, I think that, um, no, I, can, I cannot say there's a golden age. No, no, I can <laughs> Actually, I, I, I can see. I think, I think that the centrality of cinema, it is important also for the industry and also for the platforms. Because if there are good movies, then the audience, you know, they, 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 for, they push to, to, to watch films and, and, and so on, because we know that most of the time we spend a lot of, like half an hour, maybe we, uh, watching those platforms, trying to, to figure out which movie we're gonna watch. And then at the end we say, okay, let's go to sleep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that, that kind of frustrating feeling. Um, um, because, because actually what we, uh, the entertainment is important, of course, it is, but I think the society now, in this moment, because there is so, so many problems around the world, so we, I think we, and after the COVID, uh, and we've seen the world stop suddenly, you know, I think there is, like, we need good movies, we need to feel those, like, uh, war uh, experiences uh, when we watch a movie, you know, we, we, we desperately need humanity. Uh, to go to Italy to shoot the first chapter of Citadel, the first international chapter? It's a, it's a good question. I, I think as we started talking to Amazon about the franchise, mm -hmm. um, uh, we, we, we realized that we, we targeted different areas of growth around the world for, um, for Amazon's platform. Um, and we looked at how the two fictional spy agencies that we portray in, um, in the <coughs> US version, how they were gonna translate globally. And Italy was a really nice fit because of the culture, because of its, its centrality in Europe. And it, we can be the hub of a lot of 
of different European stores. How did it work? I mean, how, um, of course you had some actors, Italian actors, but also the crew. I mean, how do you balance Italian talent and the expertise you bring from here? Um, it's a great question. The, the entire series was Italian. So it, 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 it was built as a local series um, and produced by local producers, had uh, Italian actors. There was no American crew or cast or creative presence, really. The, the writers were all, um, all Italian as well. So I think us from afar, it was our job to let them you know, be who they are and make the show that is culturally authentic to Italy. Um, but also, we were. It, that, that's really what was the important part. And but but I think the the interesting wrinkle of that is like making it culturally authentic to Italy. But also, how do you make it? You use the word global. Global, right? yes. Right. How do you make a global show where it can translate globally as as part of this franchise? So um, that was the you know the, the creative you know input that we had in that regard. But we were really thrilled with. Um, with the show, and, and we we're so excited for everybody to see it. Yeah, we are. We, we have to wait until fall. Uh, later this year, yes. Later this year, okay, good. And Kelly, for you, you you have never worked in a show in Italy, worked in Italy, but yet. No, not yet. Yeah, but a lot. Not yet, right? We're saying yeah. we got to sneak it past. Them. Yes. No, but but <laughs> we are gonna help you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, but. but <laughs> But you, you worked a lot abroad, yes. in Brazil, in China, in Belize, in Haiti. Haiti, Haiti. Yeah. So what do you think, I mean, what did you like about being abroad and what you dislike? I mean, what is the strength and or the major challenge? It's exactly what you just said. It's the freedom. There's more freedom abroad in, um, one, rules and regulations, not to avoid safety, safety first, but there are some rules and regulations here that are more business restrictive, and I say that sitting in the DGA and in, inside of a union, but, yeah, but there, the I know, they have ears, sorry, DGA gods. Um, but truthfully, when you're an independent filmmaker, um, when you have to pay union rates or you have to pay these types of things and you don't have the money, it becomes very hard. It, it's almost like they are, um, it's, it's creating a socioeconomic disparity amongst the voices of storytellers. So because you don't have enough to pay whatever the minimums are for these unions, you then can't make or should not make a film that's not following the regulations. And I understand there are pros and cons to all of that. The unions are in place for a reason. But it, we have not really worked to be able to let people who don't have the finances to afford what a lot of these smaller independent, independent companies can um, afford. So it limits people's voices. So I like traveling because there aren't those same rules and regulations. But again, depends on where you are. When I was filming in China, there was somebody that was censoring our content. So here in the US, you have a freedom of speech, in a way. There's been a lot of like, there's <laughs> a, a lot of dancing going on here. But I have to say that um, it is having that bit of freedom, uh, but also filming here, you do get the benefits of protection as well. So there are there are pros and cons, but I, I did want to touch on the AI that you mm -hmm. spoke of. <laughs> then I just read an article that Tyler Perry just stopped. Um, yeah. yeah, you heard production on a what eight hundred million dollar um, studio that he was building because he saw an example of what is coming, what AI can do. So we won't have to, we won't need those huge sound stage. We won't need as much anymore. So. And so then that's going back to what you just mentioned as well, is that story is now and has always been king. And so even though we have these new changes happening, we as storytellers need to focus on telling good stories, telling stories that touch the heart, telling we, because that is something that as of now, AI can't do. It can't reach that humanity just yet. It can duplicate 
a mountain it can duplicate a beach it can make the environment sure but the one thing that we need to be able to do is to be able to tell great stories tell great stories of from the heart human stories and sorry just that for a little follow up do you think this the studio system uh, is ready for that or is into that or not oh it, they they have to be this is this is unstoppable so it's either we conform the studios are going to conform you see Tyler Perry is one of the largest studios and he's adjusting he stopped building so we can't be the old man on the lawn saying get off my lawn you know we have to adjust <laughs> to the changes that are happening around us because that's what happens I mean the cinema today is digital it's no longer film so there's always some type of change and progression and yes I do 100% believe the studios are going to because it's going to save them so much money mm -hmm. which then becomes another issue because now they're you know these strikes they're making a lot of money hand over fist but we have to be able to adjust and I think the key to that is being great storytellers that's the one thing that as of now cannot be touched thank you Scott about this local <coughs> work I'm curious uh, because I, I'm sure that you receive a lot of stuff on your desk and you're reading a lot of stuff. How do you decide, okay, this is going to work, this is not going to work? It's very simple. It goes back to what Kelly was just saying. It's the emotional experience. I think whether, it, regardless of the language it's set in or the culture that you're trying to um, put forward, if the emotional journey the character goes on is resonant, um, I, I think then, then people all over the world will, will like it. And I think you're seeing the proliferation of these international platforms like Netflix and like Amazon um, and Apple. And the reason a lot of these international films and series are working is because it is all about the characters and yeah. it's all about the themes that people can relate to in these journeys. And, and I, that's never gonna go away. Mm. And about talking about characters, Ginevra, because it, it, of course you di directed a, a, a great cast of Italian actors. You have Valeria Golino, Valeria Pinitedeschi, Alvaro Wack, Ricardo Scamarcio, but you also, <laughs> you also have an American actor. So uh, can you explain me more, I mean, ask more, uh, how did the char this character came together and how was directing it? Yeah, so in the film there's a character um, called Father Bill, and he's a priest. He's American, and uh, he's uh, been living in Italy for a while. He's an ex-drug addict, um, and uh, so I, you know, I always like an element of foreignness coming in, and it just gives, you know, for another perspective, but also for a sense of, you know, alienation in some ways. Even in my first film, Magari, there was an American character coming in, Bruce, uh, who was played by Brett Gelman. And, um, and this one is Danny Hudson. So and this, know. yes, is Danny Houston. Yeah. And so I was looking for an American actor who could speak Italian, which is obviously not a very easy. <laughs> um, and someone said, why don't you ask Danny Houston? And then Valeria Golino said, why don't you ask Danny Houston? You know, he can speak Italian, but I thought it was like, you know, something that they said. I don't know why, it wasn't really, so I kept on looking. <laughs> and then Valeria said, why are you not calling Danny Houston? You know, what's wrong with you? And so I said, okay, and, and I go on Zoom with Danny and here's, a Roman, basically, <laughs> who's Italian. He's born in Rome. Yeah. Born in Rome. He's born in Rome. He was brought up in Rome. While John Houston, the father, was shooting in the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> Not just a little <laughs> <laughs> anecdote. Yeah, yeah, just, just you know, detail. something that everybody would, would have seen. It. <laughs> <laughs> that mysterious story no one knows about. Yeah, nobody knows. <laughs> hit it off and Danny then came to Rome and he went to F 
every possible maths list and you know sort of studied to become this priest uh, and 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 you know it's 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 actually very in language is a very interesting because he had never done a film in Italian and and it really changes his ways his acting his you know what 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 comes out is definitely something that he's never done before because you know Italian is the language of his childhood it brings up all sorts of different mm -hmm. types of emotions and so it was a very in very interesting to work with that and he was uh, with playing a lot with uh, Greta Scacchi mm -hmm. who is an Anglo-Italian and who plays his sister in the film. And so she also had that same, you know, her Italian is, you know, her dad's Italian and her Italian is also perfect. But it, it, it's interesting language how, you know, what it brings out in people and the way, you know, even me, if I'm doing this panel in English or I'm gonna do it in Italian, it's a very oh, different- Don't tell me. You know. yeah. <laughs> Much funnier in Italian. <laughs> 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 well, me too. But but um, was it different to direct an American actor uh, or than an Italian one? Um, yeah, you, you have Ricardo well, I mean, on your side. I have you can Ricardo, who is, a, you know, I think every actor has a different way of working, and you know, I tend to, you know, I do it. It's my favorite part of my job work with actors and we, you know, go through their characters and, you know, just work with them and in their different ways to, you know, go with their own ways and uh, let them free to do that. I don't have like a specific method, you know, I, every, each actor has their own. And so, and Danny is a very, he likes to do, you know, he it was important for him to do the research, talk a lot, a lot about the character. We really went very much in depth with his character. It was a very complex character. Mm -hmm. And I think like most of the characters in the film are addicts and it, even if they have a, you know, each have a small part, it adds up to when you go into the depth of that, you know, and for him, he was a priest and an ex heroin addict and traumatized by his mom and all sorts of other things. He really, you know, in the beginning was like, oh, I'm just gonna go to Rome and do this small part. And then he was very deep into this character. And he's like, oh, can't I stay another week? We can't, can't we add some <laughs> scenes to this character? You know, cause it was so intense to actually go into. Did you, did you into do it? Did you add something now? I was very mean. I <laughs> <laughs> go away. Yeah, yeah. But it was great. I really enjoyed working with him a lot. Yeah. And now, Ricardo, I'm curious because I mean, you wrapped a movie with Johnny Depp. So, ca can you tell us something more about how it was being on set with him? I mean, this is a long, long project. Yeah, never-ending film. Yeah, but now you wrapped, right? Because we shot, yeah. Yes, okay. like a, a week ago in, in Turin, maybe, because with Johnny we never know. Um, uh, yeah, it was wonderful. Professionally, humanly, to work with Johnny has been like a paradise. He's a great artist, a wonderful soul. We just, we get on each other so well. And it was like uh, changing the script every day. <laughs> Receiving the scene last second. This is how I, I like to work, you know. Because never, you know, we, the first day they said, they said they were apologizing themselves, all the, the, the crew, saying, "Oh, this is the new scene just arrived. Johnny just changed everything." I said, "Wow, hello, this is paradise." Because uh, I didn't know the other scene anyway, you know. <laughs> so I was, you know, I was feeling okay. I'm all right. This is my place, you know. I don't have to feel like kind of re responsible that I have no 
because anyway, this is how I work. So, uh, just, uh, but this is a technique, I mean, because it is a technique, well, sure, yeah, it is. Because when suddenly you have, you have to do a scene of 20 pages, you know, yeah. with huge monologues, you gotta know your part. So, but I have a very good photographic memory. Um, and it's true. No, but it's true. I, I can I attest, you think when you're working with Ricardo and you're about to do a scene and he's on the telephone, he's talking, talking, talking on the telephone and you're like, how is he gonna do this scene now? It's very scary. And then you basically roll camera, he turns off the phone and bam, he goes in. Yeah. <laughs> and he does it. He does this it's and it's an incredible of technique. <laughs> of I have to be distracted from other things to, 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 to be able to just lose myself in, in, in a scene, you know, is, uh, is, a, is a conscious kind of something that after years I, I realized that, you know, it's something that I do on purpose, subconsciously of course, but uh, sometimes it's just on my, it's just an excuse, no, but I mean, but my, no, but it, because I think the creative moment is, in cinema especially, uh, you have, you have, you know, this opportunity, you can make another one, you know? So you can just throw yourself in, throw yourself in something which is dangerous and you, you, you don't know how to, to drive, you know? This is the most exciting, the, is there the, you know, the humus of what we do? You know, accidents. Uh, of course, you you have to drive. Otherwise, it's like a, a whatever. You know. And Johnny Depp drove. And Johnny Depp is the one who. Yes. Oh yes. Oh yes. I like that. It's in law. He loves the risk. That's what he's been doing all all his life. Is is um, yeah. And then he had wonderful masters like Marlon Brando. Mm -hmm. They were very close to each other. They very good friends and and Marlon uh, Brando uh, to be Modigliani, right? No, 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 no. Marlon Brando did his yeah, first movie Marlon. like called yeah. The Brave. Uh -huh. Never never come to, to America this movie, but 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 is is the other movie he directed. But um, no, they were friends and so um, yeah, you know, Marlon Brando. It's like the most incredible, great movie star of, of, of all times. And, and uh, they're very free spirit, we could say. Mm. Very free, very free. The, you know, when he sent the native to the Academy to refuse the Oscar for the, the Godfather. Mm. Come on, <laughs> there's not so many actors capable to do that. <laughs> What, what I'm saying is that, you know, it's, uh, it's even more than actor, Marlon Brando is a, is a movie star, which is something different, which is like uh, those people, like Johnny Depp. Those movie stars are, for me, people that, that exceed it. They exceed the, you know, it's all the vanity, that kind of, um, judgmental thing that we, we think about the, the actors in cinema, mm -hmm. but actually great souls, great souls, very generous. And I can say, yeah, Johnny Depp is very generous. Wonderful man. Absolutely. Scott, I, I think we are wrapping, right? So, but I want you to tell us more about your, because I know that XBO and Russo Brothers as a, pro, as a program, to support Italian American talent, so I think we are, we have a lot of them. And so, if you can tell us more about that, yes, of course. <coughs> it's the Russo Brothers Italian American Film or is that right? Fellowship. Film Fellowship. Sorry, um, it is a, a a program that's meant to support Italian American talent. Um, if you go to agbo.com, you can see um, the application and uh, how the program works. Um, we choose uh, the internal panel at Agbo. Uh, we'll choose five films that will be uh, the winners. Each winner will get $10,000. First place film will get an additional $10,000 as a prize. Um, and um, the mentor 
sponsorship as well. Thank you. 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 Thank you.